Hello, this is the first of a series of videos where we're going to be talking about biochemistry. Um, this is specifically going to be the Stryer 8th edition book, um, but you can obviously use this for, for most books as well as most editions of the Stryer. Um, something like that. So biochemistry is biochemistry. Something like that. So I'm not going to be doing all of the chapters of the, uh, the Stryer book, but, um, but most of them. Something like that. So chapter one is sort of an introductory. Um, that's, so I decided to skip it, and we're, we're going to hop right into the uh, the proteins and amino acids. So the uh, first thing, right? So, that, so proteins, um, you know, the, they're made up of the individual amino acids, stuff like that. So that their amino acids are strung together like like links in a chain, stuff like that. So the uh, each link is is going to have um, this and. Um, an amine group and a carboxylic acid group on it that are hooked together. The, that's why they get. That's how it gets the, the term amino acid, amine acid, stuff like that. So, and what gives it the special properties is actually the the presence of this um, a, a group coming off of what's called the alpha carbon. It's the carbon between the nitrogen or the amine and the carboxylic acid. Um, it's this um, these side chains that are um, that give it its property. Okay, now the amino acids are typically in the uh, in the L configuration. Like that. So if you want to to go back, um, the uh, if you remember back the uh, um, from carbohydrates, some of that if you learned that previously, those are actually typically in the D configuration. The amino acids are in, in the L configuration. So the D, D amino acids do come up, um, but they're pretty rare. Um, that so the uh, um, and so. The, for the most part, we're just going to deal with the regular L amino acids. Okay, because they're they have an amine and um, what is it? Amine and uh, carboxylic acid functional groups. They're going to um, whatever pH you're at is going to uh, make a difference as far as charge goes. So at at low pH, when you're under acidic conditions, you're going to have um, the, the, the basic amine is going to be protonated because it's going to grab a hydrogen. Um, you have a lot of hydrogens around so that you can also, um, the, um, you're also going to have just the regular carboxylic acid um, form. So with that, you're not going to have the, the negative around because the negative is going to attract the, the H positive so to neutralize. At, at neutral pH, you're actually going to have um, both forms you're going to have some hydrogens around, but not a lot. Um, so with that. And so for that, in that case, you're going to have um, what's called the zwitterionic form. You're going to have both the positive and negative charge. All of these groups are going to be charged. At high pH, so, so you can either think of it as, as not very many hydrogens around, or you can think of it as having OH, OH minus around. But that, so that is going to um, I mean we're not going to have um, any extra hydrogens to protonate the amine. And the hydroxide is going to be, it will deprotonate any carboxylic acids here to, to make the carboxylate form. So if you want to think of it this way, so at low pH, um, the amine is going to be charged, right? The, um, but the acid is not, because it has its pro proton. Neutral pH, both are charged, um, positive or negative. Now at high pH, the amine is not, um, but the acid is, something like that. So if you have, say, like a peptide here, and somebody asks, hey, you know, what's the pH, you know, at low, medium, and high, you know, sort of low pH, neutral, and high pH. All you got to do is say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to circle all the amines. So, come on. All right, so I'm going to go here and here, right? If I was going to do the uh, um, carboxylic acids, there's one here and here, right? So you're always going to have one on the backbone. A nitrogen, you know, your amino acid, okay. But you have to go down the individual side chains as well. If there's a carboxylic acid group, you gotta, um, mon you know, you gotta note it. Some of that. If you have any amines, you have to do that as well. Some of that. So at, um, right. So if we're looking at pH, um, pH one, we're gonna have, right. This is gonna be, right. We're gonna have plus one. This one would be zero. This one would be plus one, and then that would be zero. So overall, it would be a plus two. At the um, neutral pHs, 
right? So with that, so neutral, this everything's gonna be charged. So we're gonna have a, a, a plus one, a minus one, plus one, minus one. So overall, just add them all up. So plus, minus, plus, minus, that would be zero. And if you're looking at negative, or at high pH, right, that's gonna be, these guys are gonna be neutral, or, you know, no charge, right? These are gonna be, these carboxylic gas groups are gonna be minus one. So it just ends up being zero, minus one, zero, minus one, zero, minus one, zero, minus one. You add it up, minus two, that's it. Okay. So, there you go. Now the side chains themselves, they they, um, they have different classifications depending on the sort of overall properties. So the first one are the, the hydrophobic, um, or the hydrophobic ones. They uh, um, they're right here. they're right here. So with that, so these groups here, so like alanine just has a as a CH three methyl group. This one has an isopropyl group, isobutyl. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, these guys here, these are aromatic because they have, um, right, they have the benzene groups here as well as this big aromatic as well. Like that. So, um, right, you can also have charge, you can have positively charged and negatively charged. Histidine um, the, uh, is sometimes considered to be, uh, can be oftentimes charged, positively charged, so that's why it's in there. Um, you can have polar um, side chains that, that are not charged. Typically, these things are going to have either OHs or you know, OH groups, or these um, the um, the amide groups here. So with that, so and you can also have some weird cases. Now, in this case, this this chart here that I'm using, they do have the selenocysteine. Um, so with that, which is the selenium version of the cysteine, which is the the SH. Um, with that, so, um, but this doesn't pop up very often. Um, you can also have glycine, which just has a hydrogen here, so with that, so if you want to just draw that in, right, it's just going to have, it's just going to have a hydrogen side chain. And then you have proline, which is kind of a weird one because it goes from that alpha carbon up to here, um, and it's, it's a little odd, so with that, so, but it does provide a, a kink in the, uh, um, when it's put in with, a pro, with inside of a protein, um, so if you want, they do have three um, three letter codes and one letter codes. Stuff like that. So these are good. The, these are um, fairly obvious for what they would be. So alanine, ALA, um, and and so on and so forth. Um, things that are typically people messed up is is like arginine and and um, aspartic acid. Stuff like that. But but for the most part. It's not too bad. You will probably, if you're taking the MCAT, you're probably going to want to know, uh, also want to know the one letter codes. Apparently, those are on there as well. So, those um, make it slightly less sense, right? Because, right, you've got four amino acids that start with A, but only one A, right? So, they gave it alanine for arginine, right? Asparagine for the, right, for that. And then aspartic acid, they just ended up putting D. Some of them make sense, some of them don't. Um, it's just mostly. In this case, it's mostly memorizing them. Okay, so f so when we talk about proteins, we're going to be talking about um, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. And all that really means is how far you're sort of zoomed in. Okay, so for primary structure, all that means is the is the order of how the amino acids are put together. It's it's that sort of sequence. So with that, so uh, for here, right, the, the amino acids are put together by an amide bond, um, sometimes called uh, a peptide bond. Peptide is just a very short protein. I, mean, the, uh, I should say short stretch of, of amino acids with that. So but the, the primary structure is simply going to be the order in which those amino acids are done. And we typically read them from um, the N-terminal residue, right, the, the amine that, that's exposed, all the way to the, um, the what's called the C terminal, which is where the carbo uh, carboxylate is going to be exposed. So we start down here, and it's going to be so. This is a, a, a tyrosine amino acid. This is a glycine. That's a glycine, um, phenylalanine, and leucine. So that's how you read them, from this end to that end, just one at a time. Okay. So the amide does 
provide some flexibility, but it's not completely flexible because you, you do have a resonance structure here, so um, where you can move these this double bond down here. Well, actually, what ends if you want to be technical about it, you've got a lone pair here, you got lone pairs here. This actually falls down there, that moves up there, and so now you've got bring it back um, organic chemistry. Right, so now you've got the uh, um, this here. So this is not going to be, right? remember double bonds, you can't rotate around them. So you're going to be in this form, sometimes this form, sometimes. So you don't have complete rotation, but you are going to have some flexibility to it, depending on which form you're in. Okay, now secondary structure, instead of looking at the individ individual amino acids, you're going to sort of come out a little bit and look at just sort of regions within the protein, stretches of, of the protein. And so there's two um, primary ones that you see. Um, first one being alpha helices, and so they are, they're literally like um, coils, something like that. So you can sort of, this is sort of a side shot, and this is looking down at it, um, something like that. So what's happening is, that the way that they're coiling is you're getting these, um, you're getting hydrogen bonding between this part of the uh, um, this nitrogen, um, so with that this NH bond hydrogen bonding to this um, C double bond O, this NH bond um, hydrogen bonding to this um, oxygen here, and what ends up happening is that puts the side chains out, um, pointed out from the uh, from from the spiral. The other one is is beta sheet stuff like that, and so again you're going to have hydrogen bondings going between it, but you can have parallel where the the if you go from N terminal to C terminal you can have them um, go in, in parallel stuff like that. So you would read it like you know one two three four five and then come back around six seven eight nine ten eleven come back around eight nine ten eleven, but you can also have it going where they would come this way and loop back and go like this, and that's called anti-parallel. Um, beta sheets, but they're they're more of a flat structure, um, something like that. So you actually see this in spider silk, um, something like that. And so it, you can also slightly bend them, but it's more of a sheet type structure. Now, if you instead of looking at a region, if you look at a single protein um, chain, okay, that's called the tertiary structure, um, something like that. And so right, so here you see these regions of of um, of alpha helices structure the coils right there um, how about that and so but you can see how they're all the the entire chain is, is folded up if you can look at space filling model it looks like it looks like that but that so this just shows the backbone um, these were um, this ribbon structure was developed by the um, the Richardsons at uh, at Duke like that so the uh, where they noticed that you could if you just looked at what the backbone looked like you can get a lot of information on that if you want to look at how the whole thing looks like it'd be it'd be like this um, so like that so the way the protein folds okay is what it wants to do is right so most of these are going to be out in, inside of water right so what they want to do is they want to put the polar uh, amino acids on the outside but put in the the greasy ones on the inside right because Polar wants to be by water, grease wants to be by other grease. And so if you looked at the outside, so in this case, the uh, um, this is myoglobin. So with that, so in this case, the blues, if you look at just on the outside, the blues are going to be charged. Now, not there are some some greasy patches around here. You know, you can't be completely uh, um, inside. But for the most part, the blue is going to be on the outside. If you did a slice on the inside, notice how there's a whole bunch of yellow in the middle. Those are all the greasy amino acids, so they're trying to stay away from the water, so that's how they pack um, some of that, so you can, um, the, uh, but that's going to be very important for, for catalytic function. Okay, so if you're on, a, if you're on the outside facing the water, right, you're going to want those hydroph hydrophilic amino acids facing out, right, so because they want to be interacting with the water. Um, so like, so in here, here, and here, right, those hydrophilic amino acids are going to be on the outside. However, if you're in a lipid membrane, you're in a um, a very greasy um, environment with that. So what you end up doing is is now with these you have the your um, hydrophobic amino acids. Th those would be on the outside. Um, some of that if you're in that situation. So. 
the other thing that can hold these things together is not just hydrophobic effects, um, stuff like that, but there's a whole bunch of other different strategies. So you can have hydrogen bonding, right? So you can certainly see, we certainly saw that with the, uh, the alpha helix and beta sheets. You have salt bridges, which are, are ionic bonds. So you can have a salt bridge here. Um, we have a carboxylate at one end and, a, and a, um, the, uh, an ammonium um, positively charged in here. So you get a nice little ionic interaction. The, uh, you can have di disulfide bonds, which are two cysteines that have come together to make the, the disulfide here. Um, so that, and you can also have cofactors. Um, so that, so these are metal ions or, or other small molecules that can come in there that that are important structurally, uh, and they can actually help with the fold. Now, quaternary structure. That's when you have malt, um, multiple protein chains coming together. How do they interact? So we looked at. Um, one of the, the hemoglobin ones, right? So about that. So if you looked at just one of these chains, so if you look at just that yellow chain, that would be the tertiary structure. Um, but how these four um, subunits come together, or for these four protein chains, that's the overall quaternary structure. So it's, um, you can sort of see it here. We have a tetramer of, of two different subunits. You have the yellows and 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 the purples here. So about that. So but you can also have something big like the rhinovirus. So it's, so it's four subunits, um, sixty of these. Um, the uh, proteins coming together uh, to make this virus. And so this would be the overall quaternary structure. Okay, so you can disrupt the, the protein folding um, with that. So that's going to disrupt the, the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. It's not going to disrupt the primary structure, right? Because that's the individual amino acids. In order to do that, you'd have to, to um, break apart that peptide bond, which is pretty difficult. Um, stuff like that. But the way that they fold is, is if you had something like this, right? You would have these two cysteines coming together, these two, these two, and these two, uh, right? So even though 26 is way far away in the primary structure, it's it's way far away from, from this 84. When it folds up, they're going to be right next to each other. You can put in things like urea, guanidine, um, tumor captoethanol, um, that will break these, break these apart. And so now they're sort of in a sort of an open chain like this and this is what's called denature so with that you can also do heat that's why so when you cook you know when you cook meat or anything else what you're doing is you're breaking apart the these here not the primary structure but the other secondary tertiary and quaternary structures okay so now protein folding itself can be cooperative okay so you can have parts of it things like that going so it can be rather fast usually it's, it has it's resistant 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 and then it'll go with that not always but um, it can the um, parts of the molecule can fold so this um, so let's say this helices can come in here so th this is the progression of, of the um, of the fold this helix can come in and help out other parts of the of the protein to fold in this case things like that so it's not just zipping into there it's also not it's also not random because it's gonna it's as it's uh, it wants to get further and further down um, to be more and more stable and so it'll be able to um, test these things out and go in here and the uh, get down to the, to the lowest possible um, energy level so that that's where um, that protein is going to want to fold to that so okay so What's happened over the last, say, 10, um, 10 years or so is there's been a pretty um, big breakthrough in the ability to actually design proteins from scratch so that to do uh, very interesting chemistry um, or, or other things. So, that. so if you're interested, you can look at the Institute for um, Protein Design, um, David Baker's group at uh, University of Washington in, in Washington State. Um, so that they have some really cool things. Um, mostly what's happened is with um, a lot more you know, molecular biology and biochemistry information about the, the proteins as well as um, computational power um, getting up to where it needs to be. We're finally sort of at that point where we can start to build proteins from scratch and not have to do them from nature. So, um, thank you.